Chernobyl, a place where science meets the surreal. From radiation hungry fungi to unexpected wildlife comebacks and unexplained spikes in nuclear activity, these revelations are reshaping our understanding of one of the most infamous disasters in history. Get ready to unravel a series of findings so astonishing they're compelling scientists around the globe to take a second look. First up today, we have the forest fires. The Chernobyl exclusion zone has witnessed several forest fires over the years, which have raised significant environmental and health concerns. These fires are particularly problematic because they can remobilize radioactive elements like cesium-137, strontium-90, and plutonium, which were deposited in the area following the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. When the vegetation in the exclusion zone contaminated by these radioactive particles burns, the smoke and ash can carry these particles over long distances, potentially spreading radiation beyond the immediate area of the fire. This phenomenon poses a considerable challenge for both environmental management and for public health. From an ecological standpoint, the redistribution of radioactive materials can affect a wide range of organisms, altering the mutation rates and impacting the health and stability of ecosystems in and around the exclusion zone. For human populations, especially those living in proximity to the exclusion zone, there is a risk of exposure to radioactive particles carried by smoke, which can have long-term health implications. The management of these fires, therefore, is not just a matter of controlling the blaze, but also involves monitoring and mitigating the spread of radioactivity, making it a very complex task for both firefighters and radiation safety experts. Next up, we have the new nuclear reactions. It's what nobody wants to hear in relation to Chernobyl. New nuclear reactions. Can't be good. The recent detection of increasing fission reactions in an inaccessible chamber of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant has raised significant concerns among scientists and safety experts. This chamber, which has remained sealed and unobserved by human or robotic means since the 1986 disaster, has shown a worrying surge in neutron emissions, a clear indication indicator of escalating nuclear fission activity. The primary concern for researchers is to figure out whether this escalation in nuclear activity will naturally diminish, or it will require a complex and hazardous intervention to avert a potential secondary nuclear incident. The situation is like kind of similar to smoldering embers in a barbecue pit, a metaphor illustrating that while it doesn't pose an immediate explosive threat, it is an active problem that definitely requires ongoing supervision. The implications of this development are terrifying as it highlights the long-term complexities and unpredictable nature of nuclear disaster aftermaths. This just goes to show how the aftermath of the Chernobyl disaster continues to teach us and captivate us even decades later. Speaking of how Chernobyl continues to teach us more about the effects of nuclear disaster and radioactivity, next up on our list we have the radio radiation research. Ongoing research in the Chernobyl exclusion zone has significantly advanced our understanding of radiation's long-term ecological and biological impacts. Scientists have been studying the mutation rates in various species of flora and fauna within the zone, providing data on how radiation affects living organisms at the genetic level. These mutations, ranging from subtle genetic changes to visible deformities, offers insight Insight into the mechanisms of radiation induced damage. Researchers are also exploring how these genetic changes might affect population dynamics, species interactions, and overall ecosystem health. The area has become a unique natural laboratory for studying the ecological impacts of radiation, allowing scientists to observe the recovery processes in ecosystems subjected to high radiation levels. This research not only sheds light on the resilience and adaptability of nature, but also informs future strategies for managing contaminated environments and assessing the environmental risks associated with nuclear accidents. 
Next up, we have the very unfortunate psychological impacts of the disaster. Psychology issues resulting from widespread fear of radiological disease is a much greater issue impacting many more people with lethal health effects. People who believe they or others have been impacted by radiological illnesses, erroneous or otherwise, exhibit greater issues with feelings of no control or fatalistic and pessimistic outlooks. This often leads to harmful behaviors such as a lack of initiative to treat diseases. These fears are further strengthened by poor public understanding of the effects of radiation. Because of the radiation in Chernobyl, the people living there had to move, and it's been studied that these groups of people believed they had an illness related to radiation exposure more often than the citizens who actually remained inside of the contaminated regions. This brings into question the effectiveness of resettlement. Also, psychological distresses can significantly increase cancer mortality rates, possibly as much as 97%, nearly double, resulting in as many as approximately 100,000 additional cancer mortalities. From this accident, the fear of radiological illness has been way more prominent. Around our halfway mark today, we have the decaying of nature. Since the Chernobyl disaster, scientists have realized something very strange with the plants in the exclusion zone. They have realized that the dead trees, plants, and leaves at the contaminated site don't decay at nearly the same rate as plants elsewhere. This is definitely weird, I mean just thinking about it, I would have thought that the opposite would be true, that plants in the exclusion zone would decay even faster, but this is why it's good that I am not a scientist. Tim Mosau, a professor of biology at the University of South Carolina, has said, quote, We were stepping over all these dead trees on the ground that had been killed by the initial blast. Years later, these tree trunks were in pretty good shape. If a tree had fallen in my backyard, it would be sawdust in 10 years or so. To find out what was happening, or more accurately, what wasn't happening. The research team collected hundreds of samples of leaf litter from forest floors that were not contaminated by radiation and stuffed the leaves into bags lined with pantyhose. This was to keep out insects. They then distributed these bags around the Chernobyl area and waited nine months. The results were shocking. Samples of leaf litter that were placed in highly contaminated areas showed 40% less decomposition than samples that were placed in uncontaminated sites. The degree of decay was proportional to the degree of radioactive contamination at each site, according to the study. Now that really is just interesting. Next up on our list, we have the Sweden effect. I'm sure you might be wondering what Sweden could possibly have to do with Chernobyl, but don't fret, I'm here to tell you. The radioactive active cloud from Chernobyl rode the wind over to Sweden and spit out in the form of rain. As teardrop teardrops? <laughs> Somebody's really crying. As raindrops landed, so did radiation, especially in parts of north and central Sweden. Keeping food from getting contaminated was an issue in some places. Northern Sweden absorbed a whole 5% of the radioactive cesium-137 that Chernobyl released into the air. Atoms of it wound up in the lichen that reindeer graze on. That same year, after the farmer's meat harvesting season, it was discovered that almost 80% of the Swedish reindeer meat was too contaminated for sale. 80%! That's so much! Reindeer farmers had to change their practices, harvesting their meat earlier in the year before the animals had a chance to eat the contaminated moss. Because of this contamination, the Swedish authorities actually ended up raising the limit for permissible radiation in game, freshwater fish, wild berries, and mushrooms based on their view that these foods made up only a little bit of the Swedish diet. Even to this day, a small portion of reindeer can't be sold because they have too much of the radioactive element. Moving on down our list, we have the new safe confinement, also known as the NSC. This structure at Chernobyl represents a monumental advancement in nuclear containment technology. This massive structure, completed and put into place in 2016, was designed to address the critical need to secure the remains of the reactor that was destroyed in the 1986 disaster. The NSC 
that sea is a feat of engineering, designed to last at least 100 years and to withstand extreme weather conditions. Its primary purpose is to prevent the escape of radioactive material from the original sarcophagus, which was hastily constructed following the accident and had since deteriorated. Additionally, the NSC provides a controlled environment for the deconstruction of the reactor and the management of radioactive waste, effectively reducing the risk of further radiation leakage into the environment, which I think we can all breathe a sigh of relief for. This structure is not only a shield against the radiation, but also serves as a symbol of international cooperation, as its construction involved experts and funding from around the world. The NSC's completion marked a significant step forward in the long-term effort to contain the Chernobyl disaster's legacy and mitigate its environmental impact. Moving on on our list, we have the mysterious fungi. Fungi is definitely one of the weirdest things we have on our planet. Not sure if you guys have seen that documentary, Fantastic Fungi, but that thing absolutely blew my mind. It's kind of creepy, but also truly incredible. This isn't just a love letter to mushrooms. I do have a point I'm trying to make here, and that point would be the discovery of radiotrophic fungi in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, which presents a remarkable example of life's adaptability to extreme environments. These fungi have developed a unique mechanism to harness radiation for growth. They utilize melanin, a pigment found in their cell walls, to convert gamma radiation into chemical energy. This process is somewhat similar to photosynthesis, where plants use chlorophyll to convert sunlight into energy. We all struggled to say that word in elementary school when we learned about it, but in this case, instead of sunlight, the fungi are using radiation as their energy source. This discovery opens new avenues for research in the fields of biology, ecology, and biotechnology. From a biological standpoint, it provides insights into how organisms adapt to and thrive in hostile environments, which could be crucial for understanding understanding life in extreme conditions on Earth and potentially other planets too. In terms of practical applications, these radiotrophic fungi could be used in bioremediation to clean up radioactive waste or environments contaminated by nuclear accidents. The fungi are fantastic, what can I say? Next up on our list, we have the government cover-up theory. What's a good list without a little government conspiracy, you know what I mean? After the release of the incredible HBO show Chernobyl, which if you haven't seen it, it is a must watch. I'm looking at you, Taylor. Truly such a good show, very unsettling. After the show's release, the Russian government released a statement saying that the show was actually anti-Soviet Union propaganda and that they would be releasing their own Chernobyl show, which would detail how the CIA was actually the cause for the original nuclear disaster. Rumor has it that the CIA sabotaged something which caused the reactor to melt down and the whole thing was actually America's fault. I have no way of either proving or disproving this theory or legend, but I think it's probably safe to say that someone here isn't telling the truth. I'll let you decide for yourself. And finally, rounding out our list today, we have the alien cleanup. Okay, just one more bizarre theory. There's always gotta be an alien story to keep things interesting and to add to the list of questions we have for extraterrestrials when we hopefully eventually find them. Rather than the aliens causing the disaster, which might be where your mind went, instead this legend suggests that they helped in the aftermath. Apparently some people out there think that the church Chernobyl disaster wasn't as bad as it should have been. I don't think they mean it in as bad of a way as that sounds, but rather that they are surprised that the amount of people who passed in the disaster wasn't higher considering how bad the whole ordeal actually was. This coupled with an apparent eyewitness account from a man named Mikhail Veritsky, who claimed he saw a fiery ball of light hovering for a few minutes above the exposed reactor on the night of the incident, has led people to speculate that maybe our friendly alien neighbors swooped down in the nick of time to help clean up the mess that was made. Apparently, this ball of light was also seen on September 16th, 1989, when there was more radiation leaking from the unit at Chernobyl, which some claim was the aliens containing the radiation. Honestly, I'd like to think that this one is true, because what a nice thing for the aliens to do. They probably have their own nuclear weapons, so they certainly didn't need ours, and we really did not have the tools to clean it up, so I can definitely appreciate the fact
fact that they were willing to lend a helping hand. All right, all right guys, that has been our list for today. Thanks so much for checking it out. I've been your host today, Olivia Kozlowski. I will see you again soon. Bye. <laughs>